Nissan, over to you. If you can get started with an introduction and we can kick off this conversation. Yeah, sure. My name is Nissan. I work at Prime Video. Uh, my team kind of owns all the North South ranking and East West ranking on the Prime Video homepage. So, pretty much when you log in, all that stuff you see there, that's generated from the models my team owns. We've been using Metaflow in production for a bit over a year now and seeing good gains, which I'm going to talk about um, yeah, in a few minutes. So, happy to be here. Nice to meet you all. Yeah. All right. Let me kick it off. Uh, let me figure out how to share the screen. Yeah, we don't really um, use Zoom too much here. Okay, is this working? Yes. Okay, let me see if I can uh, full screen this thing. Mm, here we go. All right, is it still visible? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so to get off, um, yeah, this talk is going to be about how we use Metaflow at Prime Video. And the tagline is increasing experimentation velocity via configurable modular flows. So as mentioned earlier, my name is Nissan. I work at Prime Video Personalization. This is my email if you want to reach out to me. And this is the outline of the talk, which I'm just going to skip. So the introduction. As mentioned earlier, um, yeah, I work on Prime Video Personalization. So we own East West ranking and North South ranking of all the stuff on the homepage. Our team has over 100 production models and many, many more um, offline candidate models that we're currently evaluating. So a bit about the problem background that we're going to talk about. Um, so experimental velocity is sort of like defined as the speed and efficiency at which one can iterate through, you know, designing, implementing, and evaluating sort of machine learning models. And the goal of optimizing experimental velocity is to like you want to maximize the speed at which you can iterate through the different ideas and algorithms of your machine learning systems. And this is important because machine learning is an empirical process, which means you have to try a bunch of things until you figure out what works best. So Nissan, uh, I think, are you supposed to be on the first slide or? No, I've been switching to the slides. Is it stuck? Yeah, it's stuck on the first slide. Ooh. Mm. One second. Yeah, so we are sort of like at the Metaflow at Prime video, the PDF. OK, let me try restarting the screen share. Sure. Mm -hmm. All right, how about now? Yes, perfect. Okay, oops. Uh, okay, cool. So, uh, well, I don't think you missed much. Um, this was just a screenshot of what the Prime Video homepage looks like if you don't use Prime Video. And we're gonna get into, and this was just the experimentation velocity sort of definition. All right, so now if you look at a- Quick, quick question here. So so north, south, and east, west are basically what we see on screen, right? So east, west is the horizontal. Exactly. Uh, uh, so these are the recommendations, titles, and yeah, and north, south are like these sort of groups of titles, which we categories. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so if you sort of look at a traditional machine learning pipeline, there's a bunch of sort of well-defined steps that goes into it. So, so like you collect the data, you pre-process it, you do some feature engineering, and you train, test, and evaluate the models, and then you deploy it to production. And then once it's there, you continue monitoring it. So the whole process of training and deploying these models is like a, a complex process that involves all these coordinated steps. And it's actually um, just getting them to work well together and iterate quickly. Um, it's not as easy as it seems. So some of the challenges that we um, faced like I did some analysis as to you know, how quickly um, or rather slowly that it took us to go from ideation to productionization and sort of categorize the, the bottlenecks into these three um, areas. So the first one was um, lack of established component APIs. Secondly, um, disparity between research and production environments. And um, thirdly, sort of repetitive manual effort due to the complex systems that we had um, going on. And to go a little bit into more detail here. So the lack of um, established APIs. So what I meant was like the, the scientists would create models and each model had their own API. So if we wanted to swap up models and it was very difficult because we had to sort of adapt the model to the existing um, interface that the 
the pipelines would produce. Um, secondly, there was like lack of separation of concerns. Like the scientists, they would be doing feature engineering inside the model, which kind of made that model not transferable. Uh, we had bespoke approaches to going from research to production, like every single team had their own workflow and tooling and um, processes to make it happen. Um, and then the, the standardized metrics part, like each team, um, they, they were measuring the metrics in their own way, like even between science engineers, like they had their own way of calculating precision and we had our own way and there are subtle discrepancies. So if you're not measuring the, the thing the same way, like using the same ruler, then it's hard to tell, you know, if you're actually making progress. Um, yeah, secondly, the disparity between environments. So this also uh, refers to different tooling, configs, um, training tested methods. So for example, um, in research, we use one set of tooling and then in production, we use a different set of tooling. And well, traditionally this was like um, in research they'd use Python code and then in production, we have like Scala code or different libraries that we use. And which meant that once the research was done, ready to be sort of launched in production, then there was this whole step about porting the code, um, checking it in, doing um, code reviews, um, setting up the pipeline, setting up the, the, cadence, the periodic flows that we have to run um, everything in production, set up the monitoring steps, uh, which meant that by, by the time everything was done, you got to test everything again. And then you weren't sure that, you know, the model that you trained in research was actually the same quality as the one in production. And then furthermore, we're like measuring it in different ways. So like the, the numbers could be different as well. And finally, um, we had all these different ways of setting up things. So for example, we had different systems to set up pipelines. We had our config systems everywhere. Like we had and then files and variables um, in DynamoDB. And then we just set up the production clusters as well as the EMR jobs. And with all these things going on, these um, moving parts, it was just hard to test and verify that you know, one little change didn't actually break um, anything. Uh, which also meant that the time it took for the engineers well, and also scientists to get onboarded um, what was longer because they had to learn all these different tooling. Like the scientists, whenever they switch teams, um, there's a new set of tooling that they had to learn, a new set of processes, which kind of slowed down everything. So to address these challenges, uh, we came up with this thing called configurable modular flows. Um, so the flows part, um, surprise, surprise, we're using Metaflow. Now, the way we use Metaflow is like slightly different. So one thing, all, all our flows, um, we only have in one parameter, it's just this, this config is variable. So um, you basically pass in a bunch of config files, which specifies exactly um, well, pretty much everything that the flow needs to run. Uh, this is everything about the machine learning pipeline. So you could kind of think of it like, like the DAG cards uh, or model cards. Um, but now we also encompass everything from like the, the data loading, the feature processing, um, the model, the hyperparameters, um, you know, where you want to deploy to, like pretty much everything. You can just look at configs and it would tell you exactly um, what is being done. Um, so here, so out of the box, we provide, like we have some sort of, we call them like standardized or common flows. Um, these are just two kind of dumb examples here. But the idea is um, as a user, you can say, I want to use this flow. And then I provide it with the configuration. And that's pretty much all you have to do. Like you don't really have to write any code short of producing the config. Um, so for example, if you wanted to swap out the type of model you're using, you would specify in the config for the train step what sort of model you want to use. And I'm going to show an example of that uh, later on. So kind of to, to facilitate the, the use of this, we have this sort of CLI utility, uh, which is called ether here. So you say ether flows and then flow that you want, and then run, um, which then takes in the, the configs here. So this just um, looks up the flow name that you have specified in our list of available flows, and then just runs it. And then we also have other utilities like the, the endpoints in production, um, also to validate the configs are correct, type checking, the bound checking, things like that. Um, in terms of the configuration, we're using this thing called OmegaConf, which is it's an open source library. Um, it's a hierarchical YAML-based um, config configuration tool. Now, what's really cool about this is it has the ability to sort of merge configs together. So for example, here, um, you have this base config, and then you could say, oh, now I want to change the number of layers and the learning rate. So here it's changing the layers to be 101 from 50, and then the learning rate to be um, 10 to the minus 4 from 10 to the minus 3. So when, when you call this merge config, it just merges them from um, left to right, right being the, the one that takes precedence. And then, uh, yeah, you're off to go. Uh, we also use other thing called Hatchdict, which um, just makes specifying objects in YAML a lot easier. So 
previously, like if you wanted to say change the activation function, you would have like a string parameter. Okay, if the activation is sigmoid, then you know invoke the sigmoid function. If it's tan h, then invoke that. But with hashtag, you can directly bind Python objects inside your YAML with this um, equals colon syntax. So for example, here, um, this is binding this logistic regression scikit-learn model to this model parameter in uh, the YAML file. So once you load the, the hashtag and then you say get the model, the model here is actually going to be um, a concrete object. So you could bind objects on functional, like pretty much you can bind everything um, inside YAML. So it, it's almost like this hybrid between writing like code and config. Um, well, it's pretty much code. So in, for the modularity aspect, um, so sort of make, make everything plug and play, we, we defined APIs for sort of like the common steps in the machine learning pipeline. So for example, we have this um, data source abstract class. So if you wanted to load data from a particular place, you just have to implement this um, interface and then you're off to the races. So we have um, this, well, this a dummy one, it's open ML just to show like how it works, but we have stuff to load from S3, um, Athena, and our internal um, Amazon data sources. Uh, similarly, for the transformers, uh, we just implement the scikit transform interface. So this is mostly just fit and transform. Yeah, it's also like partial fit and things like that. Um, for the model, again, we use the, the scikit estimator um, interface, which means that all, all our models are automatically swappable with the scikit-learn models. Um, for evaluation, we also have um, an interface set up. So this one is just showing for standard classification metrics. Uh, we also have different metrics for since we do um, evaluation at the page level, so sort of like list-wise metrics as well. And yeah, so for inference, uh, we're using SageMaker Inference Toolkit for that, which needs sort of these four functions defined. So once you define these four functions, we're able to take your model and then host it um, in production. So in terms of the configs, um, so yeah, here is sort of like um, a standalone mostly standalone um, config that kind of shows how you would set up a machining pipeline to train an MS model and then deploy it to production using this framework. So just to pick apart the different parts of this config here, the first part is the data source. This is where it is coming from. Um, the preprocessor, so this is, um, well, how you want to featureize the data. Um, you can also have, so this is a dictionary. So here's just X, but you might be having um, like say you're doing a side side work and you have two inputs, for example, um, then you'd have different keys here. Um, the model, this is just some standard um, one that I stole from Scorch. Uh, you could swap this out with any sort of scikit-learn compatible model and it would just work out of the box. In terms of evaluation, you specify what metrics you want to compute here. And then finally to host the model um, online, you would specify you implement the handler, which um, had those four functions that I showed earlier. Uh, we also deploy cross region. Um, so this part down here just says, you know, which region you want to deploy to, um, how many instances, things like that. Um, here's another example where we were experimenting with changing um, our production model to, to use a list wise loss. So previously we were using um, point wise loss. And just this is just to illustrate the, the amount of changes that need to be done to swap from one loss function to another one. It was literally just specifying some additional data into the model and then specifying the new model um, to be used. So it's pretty small, pretty small amount of code. Um, well, config that needed to be done. And then finally, we also have a way. So say you, for whatever reason, you didn't like the, the steps that we had defined, we have a way for users to customize like within each Metaflow step, um, what actual pipeline steps to be performed. So these would all be performed within the same uh, Metaflow step here. And yeah, so some of the learnings that we had. Um, so the biggest one that was hitting us was these Docker time and errors. Because um, what we found was that Metaflow isn't really well suited to short-lived tasks. So for example, we had um, some steps that was just deploying models to production, which uh, didn't really take a lot of compute. So it finished in like a minute, but the amount of time it took to download the Docker image and set up the, the batch container, I think that was just like, um, much longer than the, the actual task itself. But secondly, we it was kind of running all the tasks on the same machine um, because we we had like some big machines and it would like batch was kind of dumb or I guess it's trying to optimize and saying, oh, I could run, you know, 60 tasks on this one machine, um, which was sort of depleting the burst capacity of the disk. 
So to solve that, we have a separate batch queue for all our short tasks right now. And that's been working fine. Um, the other gotcha is that if you're deploying to different um, regions like we do, and you have different metal configs, you have to clear this metaphor directory um, when switching configs. Um, so this directory has a bunch of stuff cached and to kind of speed it up, we just use symlinks. So instead of deleting the directory, we would rename the symlink to point to the current one that we're using. Um, another one that hit us, so previously we were using the, the con, the decorator to sort of set up the flows for the dependencies, but due to internal policies, we had to use our internal code effect repo. So we switched to this uh, pip-based pip -based constructor that um, Romain um, was helping me out with. And for that one, we had some problems um, deploying from, so my laptop is a MacBook and um, setting up the, the flows on a MacBook, there was some like resolving issues. Um, so I, I just disable that. So now you can only deploy from Linux to Linux. Um, the other, I guess this is a good problem to have. So previously I mentioned that we had this handoff process where the scientists would sort of write all the code and then they would pass it over to engineers and the engineers would now have to productionize it. But since the scientists themselves can be using Metaflow and they can pretty much go to production themselves, uh, we, we have this interesting problem where it's like, it's kind of unclear who is responsible for what. Like, so previously the scientists would just write the model code, but now they're actually writing the pipelines and uh, like, you know, whose job is it to write test cases now? Like, so that's something that we're, we're still working on, like getting this clear line of separation um, of responsibilities. And then finally, um, in terms of config validation, like, because it's so easy to write configs, like you, you might think, oh yeah, I just changed one thing and then uh, I know how it works. But due to the way the merging works, there's actually some subtleties involved. And uh, sometimes like there'll be a change made and then it does, it's not actually taking effect. Um, so we had to add a bunch of validation to make sure that, you know, what, what change you made was actually um, what you thought was happening. In terms of future work, um, so we have a lot of non-Python um, flows right now that is running on an internal job scheduler. And we want to migrate those over to Metaflow as well, just so that, you know, we have um, common or reduce our tech surface area. The other big one for us is hyperparameter tuning. So right now uh, we don't have a construct to easily like do good search or even like Bayesian optimization on different set of parameters. So we wanna uh, make that easy for, for the scientists to do. Um, similarly distributed training. So right now it's actually quite difficult if you wanted to use more than one um, batch instance to, to train your stuff, um, which I know SageMaker has um, built in. And yeah, so the scientists on our end, like there's a big push for us to switch to SageMaker. Um, so we, we do have plans to add like a SageMaker decorator to pretty much use SageMaker's backend for the training. Um, model extendability is another big one for us because it's like a common problem that a lot of teams have. It's like, oh, your model, um, why is it, you know, giving the results that it's giving? And finally, um, just setting up a Metaflow, like we have some changes to the a uh, cloud formation template. Um, for example, I mentioned the Docker time of thing, like we increased the EBS to get more burst capacity. Um, also just best practice around CI CD setup because every team kind of has to set up the same things from scratch. So when I say CI CD, this is, um, this is the full like CI CD plus the um, research um, into production account separation business. So just streamline that onboarding um, just so that more teams can um, well, pretty much use what we have built.